how many terabytes worth of content do you have just sitting on hard drives? Oh, I have a 14 terabyte, a 12 terabyte and an eight terabyte. Some of them are backups. I carry three, five terabyte portable hard drives with me that are like all separate content. And then I have like a drawer full of hard drives that I'm like, they've been beat up a bit. They just need to sit there and never be used again, but be an extra backup for the day when I go to pull something. And it's, I've, I've had instances where I've gone to a backup and I'm missing the files on the backup as well. Cause it just things didn't get transferred properly. Cause there's, I'm changing hard drives I'm transferring files, reorganizing as the terabytes grow. Um, so my backups of my backups have paid off. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on another episode of It Was F8, brought to you by John's Photo, where we talk to your local content creators. I'm your host, Jess Loso, and today I am joined by Ashlyn. Thanks for having me on. I'm so excited to chat with you today. Let's get to the questions. So tell us a little bit about yourself and the kind of content that you create. Yeah, so um, my name is Ashlyn George, and I'm primarily a travel writer and photographer, and I kind of have a few different pillars to my business. Um, so I have my blog and my social media channels, and um, I do some traditional work writing for magazines, blogs, selling you know my writing and my photos as well, CAA magazine across Canada or National Geographic, I've been able to write for them before. And then I do do some video work, um, whether that's on camera or behind the camera. I'm doing a little bit of less of that lately, um, but I, I will do some of that. And then I also do speaking events as well. So I will MC an event or I speak at conferences and, and different events. So yeah, I have kind of four different pillars of my business, which is really fun because it means every day is different and exciting and there's always a new challenge. How did you get started? Like that sounds really interesting that you actually got to like you write for CAA and you've actually been able like featured in National Geographic. I originally went to university. I have two degrees. I spent five years doing that. And then I decided I wanted to, if I could spend five years learning in an institution, I could spend five years learning in the world. So I designed a five-year travel plan that had me traveling to, I've been, I've been to all seven continents now. I wanted to do that before I turned 30 and I've been to more than 60 countries. And so I would travel yeah, I would travel every year for six months and then come home and work to earn more money so I could travel again. And that kind of kicked it all off for me. It slowly became a career. My brand is called the Lost Girl's Guide to Finding World. And it's kind of funny because while I'm traveling, I felt very lost with what I wanted to do in life. But I just started pursuing my passion outdoors reading free. I launched a blog for fun, never intending to monetize it. And then, you know, years later, here I am full-time doing that as a career. So it's been kind of a really cool full circle. That's amazing. That sounds like it had to be like a really comprehensive five-year plan that that wasn't just something you took lightly. This was something you really wanted to go off and pursue. Exactly. It was, it was a lot of time and effort, especially budgeting. I was paying mm -hmm. off $40,000 in student loan debt while I was traveling. Yeah. Um, when I was working, I had to make sure I saved every penny that I could for it. And then being really intentional when I was traveling, where and how I was spending that money so I could make it work. Lots of very strict budgeting. <laughs> what was that article like? Oh, Antarctica was amazing. It was really emotional. That was the last content I, continent that I wanted to get to. And it was like just the wildlife and being out on the ice and stepping foot on an Antarctic island. Like it was, it was a pretty incredible experience. And honestly, I think I'm probably going to go back again one day because I just, <laughs> I was there for about 19 days, like the whole journey. And wow. I just needed more time to take it all in because it was pretty spectacular. <laughs> is it more or less kind of like Canada in terms of coldness or is it more cold? It was minus 40 back in Saskatchewan and it was like <laughs> minus eight in Antarctica. <laughs> but it was really, it was really cool because you got like the sun doesn't set until like midnight or 1am and then it rises oh, by 3am. Yeah. So it was it was a really extraordinary experience. How long in your journey was it like in terms of years for you to be able to get to Antarctica? So I had been thinking about it for my whole life essentially, but I had really genuinely thinking about and planning for it for a couple of years. Um, I spent a year or two reaching out to companies, pricing out things, waiting to see, see what the sales were like and how the sales system worked for getting like a deal on going to Antarctica. 
And I actually, I was really fortunate. A friend of mine happened to work on one of the ships in Antarctica and he was able to provide me with a family and friends deal. I was 29 at the time. So just sneaking in the under 30 for all seven continents. And, and I had the money saved up. And so it was just being okay with spending a lot of money to get to Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear it's not, uh, it's not like going to like Australia or anything like that. It's quite the trip to plan for, but it sounds like you were set up nicely to be able to get that done the way that in, under your terms. Yeah, it worked out really well. And I was, I was so fortunate and grateful to my friend who, who offered me that family friend deal too. So <laughs> super helpful. Well, you yeah. already told us what steps you already took to get started. Uh, what were you doing before? before you started pursuing this? Yeah, so just going to university, I, I spent five years there and then the five years traveling and where it all kind of shifted for me. So I launched my blog in 2013, completely a passion project. I just was getting a lot of questions about how I was traveling, traveling solo as a female and in lots of countries that people in Canada hadn't really thought about traveling to before. So it just felt natural to create a space on the internet to share that information. So I didn't have to write a new message every time. And then where everything changed was in my final year of travel. I was traveling through Southern Africa and my mom actually sent me a job application um, to the position. It's called the Saskatchewan Wanderer. It's a program put together by the government of Saskatchewan where every year they hire a content creator to spend a year creating all sorts of different content for the province. So I, you know, I worked with the ministries of economy, agriculture, parks, culture, and sports and tourism, Saskatchewan. So I wore many different hats that year and I flew home early from Africa to take the job. So I ended my trip about three months early, but I knew it was that next step for me to be able to take it from just a passion project to something professional. And then in that year, when I was a Saskander, I did everything I could to build up a network and connections. So when I finished that year, I could step into hopefully trying to run a business on my own. And so I, I started my own company in 2016 and I've been going ever since. So it's, it's worked well so far, but there was definitely steps that got me everywhere. Yeah, no, it just sounds like you've had a lot of great experiences and connections to be able to do what it is that you love doing. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's not always easy. It's worth it every day. <laughs> exactly. Right. Like all the planning, all the budgeting, all the, all the unexpected things that come along with it as well. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, with that said, what have been some of the biggest challenges that you've encountered thus far? One of the biggest stresses for me is just making sure I have work and contracts, earning an income. So every year you kind of start over a little bit, right? So every new year that you have to file your taxes, you're like, where am I going to make money this year? And how much money am I going to make? And you don't have that answer until the end of the year. And, you know, some years are great and work just flows through into the next year and other years, it's a little bit quieter. So there's lots of ups and downs and there's a little bit of instability to that as I think any, you know, freelancer and entrepreneur knows and realizes. So that's always something I find a little bit stressful, but I also find um, with the work I do, it's sometimes a challenge to find a healthy separation between my life and my work because it's complicated because my life is my work. I'm sharing my stories and my adventures and my trips and part of who I am. So when do I shut off, you know, the, the phone and the computer and the cameras and when do I tune out? Cause I, I naturally love capturing content, whether I was getting paid to or not, I want to be out with a camera but I also have to remind myself, it's really important to be present in the moment, make real memories, not just content, you know, have that real experience. So that's, it's always a bit of a struggle for me and it's a work in progress, but just trying to find balance with that. No, I totally get that. Where, where does the public self start and the private self begin? And trying to find that balance and taking necessary breaks when, when you need to, yeah, and creating content when you need to create content. And then also, yeah, just remembering to absorb what's going around in your environment. Yeah, no, because I, I do the same thing where, because a, a lot of my work is landscapes. So I'll go off and like catch the Northern Lights or something like that. But sometimes I have to mentally remind myself like, okay, just put it on auto or whatever. Just take a bunch of like, <laughs> just time yeah. lapse it, but enjoy the moment because 
not everybody gets to do those things, right? Not everybody gets a chance to be able to just flee whenever they want to or have like financially, time-wise, whatever it is that they might not be able to do that. But like, yeah, just like these fleeting moments are for you and you have to like really take that in as much as possible. Totally. In the world of content creation, it's a bit of a hamster wheel. It just keeps going and going and going. And there's always somebody who's yeah. <laughs> doing something cooler or better or neater or more inspiring or whatever it is. And there's a lot of pressure with that, but I need mm -hmm. to remember that this is still my life and I want to take time to enjoy it and remember it. And, and I have to remember not to overshoot content too, because I'll, I'll come away from somewhere and have, you know, tons of really great photos and great content. And lots of them just sit on my hard drive. They never see the light of day because you're just constantly onto the next thing. And so I'm like, you know what? It's okay if next time, instead of getting 50 amazing photos, I get 20 amazing photos because I don't, I don't need a, you know, a ton of hard drives with dozens of terabytes worth of content that doesn't go anywhere. I would rather have those memories than too much content too. So yeah. again, it's just trying to strike that balance. It's hard though. Yeah, well, yeah, you have to be a particular type of person or be built a certain way to be able to thrive in that fluctuation that you were uh, describing earlier. And, you know, it's not for everybody, but if you're okay with, <laughs> yeah, following the ebbs and flows and <laughs> the highs and lows of not knowing, I mean, the world is your oyster. Literally, it has been your oyster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a bit of a thrill to it that I'm addicted to. So <laughs> I keep coming back. Right. The unknown, yeah. right? You never know what, like, because the reward, the payout for you, like, you, like your soul payout, the, the experiences that you get out of it is just, it's worth it to you. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So do you normally travel by yourself? Most often, yes. It's it's a mix sometimes though. So if it's, you know, if it's a media trip, I might be with a group of other content creators and writers and photographers. Um, sometimes a place brings me in just on my own. Sometimes I'm able to bring a plus one or sometimes, you know, I've done trips where it's been kind of a family multi-generational thing. My parents travel with me a lot. My mom and dad have come on trips and been part of the content and the story Aww. I'm creating and and everybody on my channels loves seeing that because my family definitely pops in and out of, of my content I make too. So lots of it is on my own, but there is space for others to join me too. And, and so it can, it's fun when others come along too, but it's also stressful for them sometimes because it's their holiday days. And so if yeah. my partner's with me and he's on holiday, but I'm working and it's really stressful, it's, it's a hard balancing act too. Yeah. But you're normally, you had mentioned, is it normally that for about six months of the year you're traveling like consecutively or just like in spurts in spurts back and forth so I might be gone for a month and then back home for a month or gone you know at a couple days every week and so I, I do try to track it and it, it ranges between four to six months every year that I'm on the road so okay and then yeah. you're usually just hunkering down back in Saskatchewan yeah, usually taking some decompression time, trying to unpack my bag before I have to repack it again and, and just chilling out. Do you follow a routine when you come back home to decompress? I really try to. Um, my routines get thrown off all the time and I actually struggle when I don't. I like a little bit of chaos, but I also recognize how important routine is. And, and it's really hard once you, if you're home for a month and you get a really solid routine, like I love to go running and biking and cross country skiing. That's my decompression time. I love to have time at home on my own, like reading and just chilling out. And it gets hard though, because if you have back-to-back -back trips and you're packing and unpacking, but you're trying to finish everything, it can be hard to keep that routine, but it's been really important for me just to stay healthy and, and be well too. So I, I try to stay it. I'm not perfect, but I think I've kind of got something figured out that does work for me for now. Schedule in the unknown fun time, but also schedule in something that's a little bit more solid, right? To be able to keep you balanced. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what kind of equipment planning and prep do you utilize to create your content? Yeah, so I, I shoot on the Sony system. Um, I primarily shoot on the Sony a7C. I was really excited when it came out because I was going to get the a7 III, but the a7C works perfect for me. And I have a backup a6100. And then I have three fixed lenses and um, three zoom lenses. And then I also have two drones. So I have an older Mavic Air, which is kind of retired, but backup if I ever need it. And then mm -hmm. I have the Air 2S as well. Um, and in, in terms of prep and, and getting ready for something. I, again, like I, I like a little bit of spontaneity, but I also like to be prepared. I always say it's kind of 
50% plan, 50% fly by the seat of your pants, because you need that flexibility, especially with creativity. If there's a moment, you see that moment, and you're like, I got to go capture this, like, this is it. And you can't always force those moments. Or if you're hoping for an epic sunset, and it doesn't happen, what's your backup plan? Or what are you going to do? Or maybe there is an epic sunset, and you're doing something, and you're like, we need to stop and capture this. So I usually like to go online and research a little bit of where I'm going. So I have an idea. But I don't research too much that it spoils that initial um, first experience somewhere, because I, I want to have that really big, you know, feeling of delight and awe when I'm somewhere new and somewhere different. So knowledge to make sure I can have a bit of a plan in place and then a little bit of flexibility around that too. Yeah, that's pretty on par with the, with the landscape photographer. It's like, be best, be as best prepared as you can, but also be prepared that it's not going to turn out the way that you were hoping it was going to be. But everything else that you find along the way might even just be better than what you had expected. And that's exactly it is, you know, even if you see a photo of a place and you're like, well, I want to go capture that photo because it's fairly iconic. It's what else is around here that people haven't looked at from a different perspective, too. So you can go also capture what everybody else is, but then seeing what else you can find. And I think that's where the real creativity comes in. Always fun corridors or alleyways that other people, yeah, that locals may not look at the same way that you're looking at as with somebody with fresh eyes. Exactly. And that's the fun part of it is taking something and people being like, where is this? And I'm like, oh, it's right here. And they're like, I had no idea. And I'm like, and that's always like the best feeling, right? Like you'll take a picture of, again, just either common places at a different time or uncommon places. And you'll just tell them like it's local or it's something that people pass by all the time. And they're like, how did you like, how did you make that happen? I'm like, literally, I just passed by there and I happen to have my camera on me. What would you say is your biggest accomplishment? So I'd say one of my biggest accomplishments, I, I did mention it earlier, but the opportunity to write for National Geographic Traveler, that's kind of the pinnacle of every travel writer's career or one of them. Um, and sometimes there's a bit of imposter syndrome when, you know, an opportunity comes your way. You're like, oh, it was just fluke or it was, you know, just right time at right place. But they actually asked me to write a second piece. And so then it really felt real. It was and it was also that confirmation that like, hey, I'm, I'm good at what I do and they want more of it. And so, um, yeah, that was just such an incredible moment in my career that it was one of those dreams in the back of my head that I was scared to ever say aloud because you never knew if it was ever going to happen. And then and then it did. And yeah, it's just it, it felt like a really good accomplishment for my career. It happened more than once. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so no, yeah, that totally makes sense to be to want that affirmation, right? To to make sure, like, do my do I vouch for my skills the way that I perceive them to be, right? And yeah, getting asked more than once by National Geographic is quite the accomplishment and well deserved. Oh, well, thank you. It was, <laughs> it was pretty exciting. <laughs> What's the wildest thing you've had happen while creating content for your account? Um, so I was trying to think about this and I know some people go viral and I haven't really had that happen. I, I do have a YouTube video that has three or 4 million views on it. So that was really cool. Um, but I think professionally, again, for me, a really cool opportunity was I was able to spend two days with a New York times travel writer and I got to hang out with her and show her around. And, um, she included me in the feature in the New York times. <laughs> and wow. again, this is the like such a once in a lifetime experience. And I would love to write for the New York Times, maybe one day in the future. I'll, I'll say that crazy dream out loud. Um, but it was just, it was so wild. I, I couldn't believe it was happening. And she was just really awesome. And we connected really well. And then, you know, I got mentioned in her feature, which was very cool. I did. I wasn't, she was writing for it. I got, mm -hmm. you know, a paragraph or two mentioned in it. And, but maybe one day. <laughs> I'll be Is that the one thing that you'd love to get a chance to do? Or is there something else that you'd love to it, do? It is something else. Um, that would be wild. That would be so cool. Um, but one thing I would like to do, I always had this idea in my head. I've traveled for six months at a time, but I've never done a full year on the road. And I would love to take a year and travel, 
But instead of making it all about work or all about like leisure and pleasure, having a perfect mix of being able to travel and work with tourism boards and destination marketing or organizations in different locations, but then also being able to make that balanced space where I do have time off to explore on my own as well. So it'd be fun to take a year and do that. Whether that'll happen, who knows, but um, that, that would be something I would love to do. Speak it into existence. Exactly. Right? <laughs> Manifest it. Yeah. Ash is going to make it happen. She's going to have a perfect combo of leisure and work creating content. Yes, that would be a dream. <laughs> we said it here first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and last question, what is a piece of advice that you would give to anyone looking to become a travel blogger? So I think everybody hears this all the time, but don't give up. Like, have a plan and be prepared, but know that this is a long-term game, not an overnight thing. And I, I often joke that the only reason that I'm where I am today is because I was just too stubborn to give up. And I did everything I needed to and everything that I could to make it happen. And, and it hasn't been easy and there's been lots of challenges and struggles along the way, but keep going, keep learning and keep reaching out to people. And when you're in those hardest moments, go through them. Don't give up on them. So just keep fighting. If you love it that much, you're going to make it happen, right? Exactly. And not every day is wonderful, but it's, it feels good to work towards something that you really love. So that's the difference for me. It sounds like you are right where you need to be. Well, thank you for joining us. And thank you to our viewers for joining us. And until FA brings us back together, we'll see you next time.